وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As always, we begin with the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to exalt the mention and grant peace to our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to his family and his companions. We're speaking about homeschooling, and this is the second part of my nasiha, my advice to the parents as it relates to homeschooling. And we had spoken about the importance in the previous episode of flexibility and embracing the fact that you can do different things and that you don't have to follow necessarily a particular pattern, and you don't even necessarily have to follow what another homeschooling parent or home educator does. You don't need, because they teach their children uh, three subjects a day or five subjects a day, doesn't mean you have to teach yours five subjects a day. You can do what is right for your child, and that's one of the greatest benefits of homeschooling, is that you can actually do what's right for your child, and what works for them, and what works for you. And one of the biggest arguments you hear all the time is that, well, I'm working or I'm busy and I don't think I can manage it. And that's true. Some people are busy and it's difficult for them. But actually, sometimes if you looked at the way that you could just change the timings around and the way that different parents could perhaps share the responsibility, subhanAllah, you would see that it is possible to use that flexibility that is within homeschooling uh, to benefit the child uh, in a better way and to, to take advantage of the advantages that are there. Now we come to talk about the issue of uh, qualifications because this is another major issue people have as it relates to homeschooling. First of all, we should say that you need to establish the legality of homeschooling where you are because it's not legal in every place. In some places it's not allowed, in some places it is. But again, in this, I don't recommend that you just follow what people say, but you explore and you do, go into whether there are alternatives. And I think that there is an ayah, lie that uh, it comes to mind in this regard, and, and I, I really feel it's really important to share. And that is the statement of Allah Azza in Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 116. وَإِن if you follow most of the people on the earth, they will misguide you away from the path of Allah. They only follow guesses and they simply are using up, wasting their time. Here, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us the danger of following people blindly. And I believe this is so important as it relates to all aspects of education of your children and particularly homeschooling. Because for a lot of parents, what happens is you listen to people, they say it can't be done. And then you say, okay, it can't be done, for example. Or you follow an exact copy of what someone that you know who is a home educator, what they're doing for their child. But ultimately, just following people without really researching and understanding it is going to take you away from the path of Allah. And it's going to take your children away from the path of Allah as it relates to their education. So I think it's really important that you really look into the issue yourself. Look into alternatives and keep on searching until you find the one that works for you. In some, some areas, it's not allowed for your child to be outside of the education system. In other places, it is allowed, but they can't get a qualification until they enter that education system. So it might be the case that what you decide to do is to home educate your child for a period of time and then in the, the minimum amount that is required, they have to go to the school. It may be that it is allowed, but it has disadvantages to it. For example, the education, the qualification is not recognized by the country because they were homeschooled. This is the case for some people. And if this is the case where you are, what you could look at is, is it possible for my child to sit their exams abroad or via one of the countries that has a more open uh, sort of outlook towards home ed education 
and indeed many of the Western countries whose qualifications are so highly valued by people in the worldly life have very open policies when it comes to home education. So these are all things to research and it's not really the purpose of this episode to talk about those, but it's just interesting to show how you can broaden your horizon. You know, you're told it can't be done, you can't do it. So then you look, you, you as a parent, you can't just accept that and say, it can't be done, okay, then I'm not gonna, now I'm not gonna do it. Instead, you have to look and say, okay, what are the obstacles? Well, the obstacle is that the certificate isn't recognized. Okay, what are the options for me studying or me encouraging my child to sit their exams? It doesn't even have to be necessarily abroad since many of these countries offer places where you can sit exams in the same country that you're in, for example. Now someone may turn around and say, well, isn't there a danger in that? Because aren't we going back to the same curricula that we said before that they're full of problems and, and you know that they can encourage the child towards atheism and so on? the same curriculum that we were telling people to avoid before. Now here is where I think that you can really get the advantages of homeschooling. Because ultimately you're not gonna reinvent the wheel. And we're not gonna say for you to completely formulate your own curriculum. But what we would suggest the easiest way to do is to choose the best curriculum for your child in terms of the existing curricula that exist. And those could be from a Muslim country. They could also be from a non-Muslim country. It might be because that's the exam you want the child to take in the end. For example, I want my child to take uh, exams according to the British examination standard, and therefore I'm gonna teach them according to the British curriculum, for example. But doing that doesn't mean you have to accept all of the falsehood and the evil that that contains. Instead, you as a homeschool parent, you as a home educator, you can take that material and filter it. First of all, a lot of the, the stuff that is really bad in it is optional anyway. It's not even part of the core uh, curriculum. So a lot of the stuff that we hear about these, that, these, uh, that these countries teach and that go on in their schools are not even part of the core curriculum. They're not even part of the things that are uh, critical to the child passing the exam or that are related to the examinations at all. And even when they are, so I'll give you an example of both, issues around relationship education and stuff like that. It's not part of the core curriculum, generally speaking, so you don't need to teach it to your child. So all that stuff you read about them teaching in schools to children about relationships, you can cross it all off because not a single part of it comes into the exam or not a single part of it has any relation to the examined topics. So that's an example of that. But what about something like Darwinian evolution, which is part of the core uh, biology syllabus in most of the Western curricula, and indeed probably most of the curricula around the world, that Darwinian evolution is there. So here is where what you can do is, how we talk about integrating Islam, is when you come to the topic of Darwinian evolution, teach your child the Islamic concepts and teach them the falsehood and the, the, how it's incorrect, the, the, the theory that was put forward by Charles Darwin and those who put it before him and after him, and why it's wrong. And what you do here is you can teach your child that when it comes to the exam, write it in the way that you don't, it's not necessarily what you believe. So if they say that, uh, did human beings evolve from apes? The child can simply write for the exam that according to Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, human beings evolved from apes. And according to him, I'm according to us, but we know for sure that it didn't happen because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us and the Prophet sallallahu told us. So we don't need uh, Charles Darwin and we don't need his thoughts about the issue. But in terms of passing the exam, they can just write the, the exam like that, that according to him or according to what we have learned in the syllabus or according to the textbooks or according to what many scientists think today, and so on. And they just write it for the sake of passing the exam. But they have the ability to respond to it because you've given them the Islamic tools. They know why it's wrong. And the parents say, well, I can't do that. I don't have the ability to, to, do, that kind of, to do that kind of thing. How do I even you know, approach that? But that's why we said that it's not necessary that you as the parent should teach everything. 
Why can't we even involve an external tutor, for example? Why can't we even involve uh, Islamic teachers or their YouTube content, for example? Or we could arrange, we could say to the local Islamic teacher, for example, that we have a, a group of homeschool children and they have some issues they would like to raise about their, the content they've studied in their courses. And could you address that for it? These are all things that can be done, inshallah ta'ala. And they're not, they're not, inshallah, difficult to arrange when a person has the himma, when they have the, the, the high aspirations and they have the, the motivation to be able to do it. So as we said, when you take this curriculum, and I would suggest that the easiest way is, and it's not the only way, the easiest way is to take the curriculum that you want your child to sit the exam in, in the end. And to remove from that curriculum anything un-Islamic, which is not part of the examination. Just remove it from the curriculum completely. As for what is part of the curriculum and is un-Islamic and you need it for the exam, teach your children why it's wrong, teach them the Islamic uh, understanding and give them the evidences for it and really give your time and attention to teach them that. So that inshallah, when they come to the exam, they're aware you know, that this such a thing exists, but they don't let it settle in them. And this is the same for if your child goes to school. The same thing if your child goes to a regular school, exactly the same thing. They're going to come to a point in biology, except in regular school, it's probably going to be more because all of that um, non-core content, the content which is un-Islamic, which you can't get rid of, which the school teaches, you have to do the same thing. Go to the child and erase those shubuhat from their mind. Get rid of them. Explain to them the Islamic answers. If you don't know how to do that, that's fine. Nobody's requiring necessarily said fardu kifaya, generally the answers to all these details and the response to the shubuhat. This is a collective obligation. But find the right person that can educate your child about that and help them to be able to do that, inshallah ta'ala. Give them some you know, support to be able to get over those issues and understand the right Islamic uh, the right Islamic understanding and the right Islamic teachings as it relates to them. So you take that curriculum, get rid of all the stuff which is non-core, which is not part of what is needed for the examination. And here also you can be really, really flexible as it relates to your child in terms of the extra subjects you want to add on. You want to add on Arabic in there? Why not? Maybe they could even take that Arabic as an exam formally because even though you're teaching them Arabic for the purpose of the Qur'an, Sunnah, and so on. Alhamdulillah, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. But on top of that, in addition to that as well, you also have the added advantage that you may be able to even send your child to take a regular exam on that topic, like a regular uh, state-based exam on that topic, and they could get a qualification from it as well, which is one more qualification, alhamdulillah. So you can add in there. When it comes to things like history, just because the syllabus stops at the history of Britain from, you know, 1066 until 1945, doesn't mean that you have to stop there. Doesn't mean that you can't have extra lessons talking about Islamic history and bringing in your Islamic content in there. It doesn't mean that you even have to teach that in the first place if you think it's not that valuable. So you can choose the things that work for your child. So one of the things you can, as, as parents, which you can do, um, when it comes to this and in relation to the ayah we mentioned in Surah Al-An'am If you follow most of the people on the earth they will take you away from the path of Allah is that also as parents you have to also uh, when you think about your child's future prospects and a lot of people also bring this up when it comes to homeschooling when, it, when you think about your child's future prospects also realize that the world of work is changing and before, so for example, some parents might say Without a degree, my child cannot possibly be successful. They, they won't even be able to get a job. A, de a degree is a necessity, they might say. But we might say to them, and again, every country is different, but we might say to them, that might have been the case when you came into the world of work. But that doesn't have to be the case now. And in fact, what we see now is we see that the whole world of work is changing. The kind of jobs people have is changing. The way people change careers is different. The kind of jobs that are up and coming, that are, have great potential in them are also different as well. So ne not necessarily just picking the standard subjects that everybody goes with, although I'm sure there is a core of sort of, you know, usually people talk about English, maths and science or whatever that's the sort of most important in terms of that. But what you add on and what you give them in terms of extra information 
you've got to look at where you think the world of work will be, inshallah, in, you know, in, in 10 years time, in 15 years time, in 20 years time. So you look forward and you see, okay, we see that, for example, these, this kind of, these kind of skills are very much in demand and are going to be in demand. And inshallah, we're going to encourage our children to do that. And there's no reason why you can't do that. And then you can either look to get a qualification in it, or you can leave it without a qualification. And maybe in the future, they could get a professional qualification on that, in that particular subject. It's also important to broaden your horizons beyond just uh, traditional subjects that are, you know, traditional education in that way. But what we want to show is that what you need to do is to look at where the gaps might be and give your children the different experiences of all of those different things. So you give them an experience of uh, building things, you give them an experience of uh, the, the, the sort of theoretical study, you give them the experience of the kind of arts and humanities in an Islamic way, removing all of the non-Islamic stuff from that. And you don't know where it is that your child will find that they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them an, an inspiration and motivation in that particular uh, in that particular field. So there's nothing wrong with giving your child, and I think as a home, school, home educator, you have the ability to give your children a far wider range of experiences, doing many, many different things, many different things, and giving them the chance to experience those different things. And letting them, you know, see where they have the greatest ability and where they have the greatest inclination and motivation towards it. And of course, integrating the Islamic education, we've already spoken about putting a roadmap together for your child's Islamic education. So likewise, putting a roadmap together for your child's uh, worldly education, but doing that in such a way that you look at your circumstances, you look at the qualifications you want, you look at the jobs and the environment and where the trends are going, and you try to give your child a wide range of experiences, and you try to remove as much of the haram content as possible, and where the haram content does remain, you challenge it, you explain it, and you refute it. So that's a, you know, that's kind of an overview, if you like. So let's get into some specifics now. Let's talk about how we actually handle this as parents, because we're just you know, one person, two people. How do we actually manage all of this information and all of this knowledge? And as we said, I just want you to, to again, appreciate the flexibility. There's nothing wrong with bringing in a tutor. There's nothing wrong with sending your child to a particular class for a particular subject. If you as a parent have determined that that's the most effective way and the best way in terms of fearing Allah as much as you can, and also you know, achieving what your, what your goals are in terms of their Islamic achievement and what they need from the worldly life. So at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with having that flexibility, but how do you go, how do you go about it? So as we said, I think that it doesn't hurt to be broadly guided by a standard curriculum, which is well accepted in the country where you are based. So it might be, for example, if someone is based in the UK, say we wanna follow the British uh, curriculum, and doesn't mean that we have to follow it letter by letter, but we're just gonna use that as a rough guide of where our child should be at each stage in the development. And we're gonna be quite happy to go off on a tangent and to delete things and get rid of things, but we're just gonna use it as so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It may be that you choose a different country uh, curriculum to the one that you are living in, because they may have advantages you may feel that it's, it better supports the nature of your child and the style, the way that your child learns. It may be that you, you, know, you feel that your child learns better through projects. And there are certain countries whose curricula are project-based more than they are you know, sort of based on the learning, the theories and things like that. So those project-based learning is a big thing and, and people, some people would rather do that. So they say, well, I'm gonna get my child to study through this route because of that, but that's a guide. So now, if you wanna actually implement that on a, you know, on a sort of, how you actually manage it from the early age, then I really believe that you can divide your child's study into four phases prior to their main exams. Now, when we say main exams, uh, countries differ, but typically main exams are the exams that a child sits between 16 years and 18 years. In the UK, that could be GCSEs and potentially A-levels. 
um, in other countries, they, everyone has something different, but most countries have some sort of standard exam, which is mandatory or somewhat mandatory, which takes place between 16 and 18 years old, the high school exams or, you know, the exams prior to going to university or college. So talking about this, I, I would typically divide your child's education into four phases. You don't have to, because remember, it's all about flexibility. If you want to divide it into 10, you can. If you want to divide it into two, you can. But I'm just giving you some nasiha that what worked for me is to divide it into four phases. The first phase is the preschool phase, the preschool phase. And in this preschool phase, I think you want to prioritize play and you want to prioritize learning both the is fundamental Islamic things like the Islamic alphabet and so on, as well as, you know, starting Arabic at a very young age, inshallah, that would be a beautiful thing because that will just get them to grow up with the Arabic language as opposed to being something they start learning at 10 or start learning at 15 or start learning at 25 like some of us did or start learning at, you know, 20 or whatever as, as some of us did. But, uh, you know, we want them to sort of be comfortable with it. So I would say you, this one is not as difficult. You can take inspiration from what the non-Muslims have written. You know, if you want to look at some of the uh, non-Muslim uh, books that have been written about uh, teaching your children at, at that age, at the preschool age, you can look into it. But a lot of preschool is, is a combination of two things. It's a combination of, of learning through play, having lots of different experiences, and also preparing them for what they will need in the first year of school. So it's a good idea to have your eye on the first year of school, what the kind of things they would need, but don't, don't marginalize Islam here. Bring in the Arabic language, bring in the alphabet, the Arabic alphabet, reading it, bring in, you know, don't, when you have that flexibility, you've got that beautiful time with your child where your child really doesn't have that huge pressure to conform to a particular standard you have a chance to actually bring Islam in there. Should you send your child to an Islamic nursery? Perhaps there might be some Islamic nurseries that are excellent, that do a great job of that. Every place is different. Every country is different. So you look at what you have the options for and you make a decision about whether that's beneficial or not for you there. In terms of the Quran, at that age, I would advise that, and I asked my teacher about this, my Quran teacher about this, and he advised me um, when we, I used to learn with him in the Masjid al-Nabawi, the Shaykh, he advised me, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he said that, you know, really probably it's, for most children, it's around the age of five where they become a bit more serious about that, you know, committing to memorizing and learning the Quran. Some are way before that because it depends on the age of the child and the ability. But generally before that, you should be definitely getting them to hear the Quran a lot, listen to the Quran a lot. SubhanAllah, in nursery, what do most of the children learn? music and nursery rhymes and dancing and all sorts of things like that. What do we want them to learn? Quran, you know, listening to the Quran, hearing the Quran, positive, excellent, you know, activities, things that will benefit them, inshallah, a wide range of experiences, and also to be proficient in the skills they will need when they go into the first year of school, as well as the skills they will need in the first year of Islamic school as well. Because what we, at least what I'm doing right now is we have a, a, a dual curriculum. One which is taken from the sort of the, the, the Western model as a guide of what the child should learn at each age. And the other one, which is a pure Islamic roadmap. And each one we're looking at, okay, in the first year, what are they gonna need? And just giving them some pre preparation for that and getting them ready for it. Again, no harm in benefiting from books, materials, websites, uh, things you can subscribe. There are some great websites you can subscribe for just a few dollars or a few pounds every month and they give you materials, lesson plans, examples, and you can adapt them. You know, if you see there's some elements in there that are not Islamic, you can adapt them and inshallah ta'ala, it's not so difficult. There's a lot of things you can learn there and a lot of things you can experiment with and a lot of resources available for you to print out, learn, books you can buy, and you know you can inshallah uh, be flexible and learn around it like that. The next phase that I want to talk about is the what I would call the primary school phase, and that is the phase of uh, where again again every every schooling every every school is different, but we're looking at somewhere around to the age of ten or eleven years old, something like that. 
And it depends. Every you know school is different. It could be a little bit more, a little bit less than that. 10 years old, 11 years old, something like that, where the schools change. And sometimes even the, the course material changes. So again, in this early phase, I personally found that there is so there are so there is so much material available online, lesson plans. Uh, you don't need a formal textbook unless you feel certain that it's needed in your country's learning system. Usually, you don't need a formal textbook, and you can do a lot of uh, project-based learning with them. And to be honest, you can really you know you can go and get resources. You can go to your local, even the local bookshops and buy books that are for you know children to learn from English for ages 3 to 7 English for ages you know 6 to 7 5 to 6 4 to 5 all of these different uh, revision books and playbooks and study books and things you can get there's plenty of ideas there's so many ideas online there are websites just dedicated to providing teaching resources and many teachers use them many teachers in school even for their lesson plans use certain you know big websites that they download resources from and lesson plans from and worksheets from as a home educator you can do exactly the same add to that all of the resources from other home educators and honestly i don't think that the primary level is that is that difficult at that primary level what you're really looking at is to make sure your child is at least maintaining average as it relates to the standards that are expected and that's where the curriculum comes in it's not really about um, us following the way that they do things there or the way they do things in that country but just keeping an idea that my child is meeting the standards of an average child in school and inshallah ta'ala you'll find with homeschooling it's way better than that because one of the great benefits of homeschooling is you spend so much time with your child and your child gets one-on-one -on -one teaching or even if you've got three children one to three teaching or if you've got five children one to five teaching but that's way, way better than the 1 to 30 teaching or 1 to 25 teaching they would have in a typical, in a typical school. So there's no harm in, you know, in terms of when you, you, you benefit from that and your child actually ends up going ahead. Because even if you're giving them two hours a day, and there's nothing to say you have to do two hours a day. You could do one hour a day, half an hour a day, five hours a day, seven hours a day. What you think, but you want to just make sure that your child is meeting at least... The, the average standard set out by the curriculum in that year. So that if there is ever the case that you did have to put them into a school, you know that they're matching the same standards that you have, that, 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 that are kind of taken by the whole country or that are kind of accepted by the whole country. So that's not a bad idea to kind of measure them. They might fall short sometimes. That might happen in school. They might be way ahead in other aspects as well but also that Islamic education. So how do we deal with the Islamic education at the primary level? Here's where really we can start the roadmap because the children are old enough to start their hifth and to start the hifth of the Quran and the hifth of Hadith, the hifth of Mutun. And that's what we talked about in the Islamic roadmap to so start with those children and really pushing them in that regard. Because again, primary school is relatively relaxed as it relates to, there are relatively few examinations usually. There are, there, the pressure is relatively small at that kind of age, the age of under 11 years old or 12 years old, that kind of age is very minimal amount of pressure and expectation. So if you can get them ahead in terms of homeschooling, you can use the rest of that time for their Islamic education, their hifth, and start them on the understanding the older they get. We talked about that when we talked about a roadmap for your children's education in terms of Islamic education. The next phase is the phase where they are transitioning towards their more uh, sort of their final examination. It's not the actual final examination time. There's a time before that. So if we said that the final examination is at 16, so then from 14 to 16 would be the time when they're really completely focused on that final, um, on that final uh, examination. However, the time before that, so you can adjust these according to the country you're in, but let's just say that the final exam is at 16 years old. And there are two years of, of preparation. There are two years where the exam content is taught and the child is expected at the end of that to sit the exam. So that covers 14 years old and 15 years old. 
what do they do in that gap between 10 and 14 or 11 and 14 or 15? That gap where they are transitioning into the school, the secondary school, we would probably call it. They're, they're moving into the secondary school. And in that time, they're not really preparing for the exam as such. I actually found that in a lot of, uh, a lot of curricula, the a great amount of material is repeated here. So it's taught in a, in a more simple way, and then it's taught again for the exam later on. And I think, honestly, what you can do here is you can take the textbooks that are typically taught in that year, and you can you know, base your lessons around them. Or again, you can, you can get materials and, and lessons online, various YouTube resources also, where people teach lessons for the kids. But here you need to kind of start to think about their exams. Because one of the things that I think you can end up doing is you can end up with a lot of unnecessary repetition at that stage where they're learning something. And then, you know, two years later, they learn the exact same thing with one extra step. And I understand the idea of repetition for the purpose of learning. That's an Islamic concept. You teach someone more than once so that they absorb the material. But I think also it can be done in a way that's wasteful. And I think when you actually get involved in, in home education, one of the things you'll see is how wasteful the curricula are from the, the, the different countries and the different standards that exist. They waste years of your child's time with things that are just utterly unnecessary or repeated for the sake of just filling the time, for the sake of filling the time. And I'm sure that there are you know educators and people who wrote those things that have reasons for that, but practically when you look at it, you think that, you know, to be honest, what says that my child can't understand that at that age? If they can understand it, and I understand that in school, the reason this is done is because you have to go with the average child. But if your child is doing better than that, then there's no reason why you should restrict them. There's no reason why you should restrict them. And in this, I would even advise taking exams early if they can, because there's many uh, situations where as a home educator, you can sit, your child can sit their exams early or stagger their exams, space their exams out over two or even three years instead of taking them all at one time, because there's nothing to stop you doing that usually in many systems. So here, uh, I would say don't waste time in this gap between 10 years old and, and 15 years old or 14 years old. Don't waste that time with things that are unnecessary. Get them into the material, but according to, you know, the ability that they have. They don't have to push it all the way. Like if there's a grade from, let's say, for example, uh, there's a grade from five to nine, with nine being the best and five being kind of an average. If they, at the age of 11 or 12 years old, are at the level where they've covered the material for a five, then inshallah, over time, you can push them a little bit every time up, you know, push them up a bit further, inshallah. And ultimately, you're gonna have to look at your own child in that. You're gonna look at your own child, you're gonna look at where they are, what they're managing, what they're comfortable with. If you have to delay their exams two years, what's the harm in that? If your child is struggling, or your child's not really getting the idea, or you wanna give a little more time to the Islamic stuff, what's to say that you can't just delay those examinations, two years or a year, who said that you have to take them at exactly that year, unless it's legally mandated, which in some countries it is, you can't avoid that in some countries, but in the vast majority of situations, it's not legally binding for the child to take that exam on that particular day. Rather, they could take it before, they could take it after. So now we move on to the last phase, which is just before the exam, the year before or the two years before the exam. And here, I believe that in this case, you one of the best techniques, it's not the only technique, is instead of you uh, going through textbooks, go through exam papers. Because the textbooks, you moved it, if that makes sense. You, you moved the textbooks earlier. So the stuff that they would do in the textbook for a 16-year-old, you maybe covered it when they were 14 or 15. And that might sound really difficult, but in homeschooling, it's not because they, they have way, way more productivity than they would in school, generally speaking. So you've kind of moved the textbooks back forward a little bit, and you left that time at the end for practicing to fit the exam. In other words, giving the child the skills they need to sit that exam. And that's what all or many of the very top schools and the private schools do. They train their kids specifically how to pass that exam. 
So they teach them ways to do things quickly, techniques for, for doing well in the exam, um, questions that come the most frequently, and they give them lots and lots of practice past papers and things like that. Again, all of these are available online. Uh, usually if your child is registered in an exam center, even the exam center will be helpful and give you uh, exam papers and things like that to do. There Usually there are archives online. There are even online services where you can pay and they can give you the exams in electronic format and the child can take them and they, somebody can mark them. There are so many things that are available out there, but I think you transition towards the exam. And this is where we talk about the, that flexibility as it relates to the when the child takes the exam. For example, you could you, you might find that the exam time is once a year, twice a year, or in some countries, even three times a year that they can sit exams and you can stagger them. So you could give them an exam at 14 years old in the subject they're doing best in, an exam at 14 and a half years old in the next one, an exam at 15 years old in the subject that they are two subjects they're doing well in at that point and so on. Or you could delay all the exams until they're 17 instead of 16. Or you could, you know, you can do any combination of the two, including the Islamic exams. And, and we want to encourage people as it relates to the Islamic stuff and the Islamic roadmap that also the person uh, gives an attention to Islamic, uh, to, to doing really well Islamically. And that could be like an ijazah, for example, that a child gets an ijazah, for example, in the Quran, an ijazah in a certain book, because this is our Islamic tradition. And it's not nice to give up our Islamic traditions. You know, subhanAllah, we have an Islamic tradition that you study a book and you study it from a teacher and the teacher gives you an ijazah, a permission in this book that you have studied it from them and you've taken it from them and that becomes like a qualification to you. And that's so, so valuable if it's possible to get it for the child as well. So integrating that into their whole environment. And what you'll find, inshallah, is that the Islamic side supports the, the, the other side. The, the worldly sciences. And even the worldly sciences, to a certain extent, some of the study skills could also support the study that you do in your Islamic studies as well. So the child, you know, develops in that way, inshallah. Again, this has been a very, very brief discussion. And to be honest, I could probably do a whole series on this, uh, which would just be called home educating. But uh, it's not really the place for it in terms of the Muslim family. I just wanted to touch upon and inspire people that it is possible. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have to bring in a tutor. And subhanAllah, sometimes people talk about money and, and in reality, you might find homeschooling is significantly cheaper than sending your child to school, even in countries where, where, where the education system is free. SubhanAllah, the amount of money you save on uh, not having to buy their school uniforms and textbooks and all this type of stuff, or paying school fees or school transport or whatever it might be, it might, it's more than enough for, for you to be able to pay for things like a tutor if they need some extra help in something. And you're giving that priority to the Islamic education as well as giving them what they need in the worldly sciences. SubhanAllah, you can see children, and, and we've seen examples, homeschool children going on to top universities. And I'm not saying universities is a great idea at all, but the point is that their home education didn't stop them being accepted into top universities and getting jobs in, in very, very, which require a very high standard of education. There's no reason why a homeschooled child should be any less than a, a child that has the best education in the best private school in the country. And in fact, you should be able to find that it's even easier to achieve that for your child in terms of home education, along with the flexibility and along with having that relationship with your child. And ultimately, I think I'll finish with this point, inshallah ta'ala, that one of the best things you can get out of home education is building that relationship with your child. You know what they're studying. They come to you. you you're able to you see when certain non-Islamic elements come in. You can challenge those. And also you feel like you really did the tarbiyah that was obligatory upon you. You feel like I actually did my job. I actually educated my child or gave them an education. And there's no reason why you should involve other people in that teachers, tutors, Islamic societies, even schools, because you might find in some countries you need to put your child in school for a year. Maybe your circumstances are such that you need to put your child in school for a year. But I think if you do this right and you really think about it and you're creative and you seek the help of Allah Azza wa Jal, ihris ala ma yanfa'uk wasta'in billah wa la ta'ajiz. Seek what will benefit you and what will benefit your children and ask for the help of Allah.
and don't feel that you can't do it. SubhanAllah, you'll see that your children will enjoy it more than they enjoy their regular school, inshaAllah ta'ala, and they will benefit from it in terms of their Islam in a way that is, inshaAllah, immeasurable. Uh, you, you know, it can't even be put into words how much they can benefit from it, inshaAllah. And all of those harms that people say in that takhweef, that scaring people that people do, where they tell your child won't be able to talk to anyone, your child will be introverted and they won't be able to work as part of a group and so on. And all of this, you'll, you'll realize the reality of it, inshallah, when you get involved. It does require lots of research. I would certainly advise trialing it before you, before you just take your child out of school like that. Test it on a weekend maybe, one day a week, on an evening. Have a go and definitely subscribe to homeschooling groups. Look online, even, even, even here. There is no harm in looking at the way that some of Ahlul Kitab structure their homeschooling. Even though I think that there's enough from the Muslims that you probably don't need to do that. But even, for example, Christians have a long tradition of homeschooling in order to avoid the Muharramat. And subhanAllah, they barely have any Muharramat. I mean, there's barely anything haram for them. And still they homeschool their children to avoid what they consider to be from the Muharramat, subhanAllah. So there's also, they have also resources and books and methods of how to teach. Explore different countries. Because I think when I started off, I limited myself just to the country that I knew. And I found that there were actually better systems in other countries. Uh, so inshallah, there's explore what's available, get books, read. At the end of the day, it's not going to hurt you anything. If anything, it will benefit you. And like I said, don't feel that it's only that you have to homeschool your child full time. There are so many other options, halfway options that you can do so that you can at least say, you know, I feared Allah as much as I could. I did the best that I could with regard to my children. That's all we have time for on the topic of homeschooling. We're going to be talking and that actually brings us to a conclusion on the topic of tarbiyah in general. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be talking about other rights of the child in the next episode, inshallah, because there's more than enough we've talked about education now. For certain, it didn't cover everything. And there's a lot, lot more to be said. But inshallah ta'ala, it could just be something just to give people a bit of inspiration. And others can inshallah take on that responsibility to, to help people to be able to do that. And Allah is where knows best. Wa salatu wa salam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.